was not raised in a Christian household. And growing up, my parents were divorced twice. My father was an alcoholic. And as soon as I became a Christian, you know, I was, my heart, of course, was burdened for, for my father. Uh, my mother had become a Christian. My brother was a Christian. But my father was just not even thinking about becoming a Christian. And so I had gone to a church and somehow in the course of listening to different speakers, somebody had come through our church in the 80s and said something like, if your entire household isn't saved, you have no right to be preaching the word of God. And so I was like, okay, wow. Because I knew that there was a call of God in my life, but I also knew that I didn't just have an unsaved dad. I had a completely unregenerated, heathen, sometimes embarrassing in Christian circles, father. So anyway, I began to become passionately involved in my dad's salvation. And so I remember John and I, we invited him to church. We tried to preach to him the whole time. He was just smoking cigarettes and cussing at us and drinking. And then we took him to church. And basically the entire time we were at the church service, I think I might have been praying in tongues and staring at the side of his head. I don't know. I'm sorry, but it, it's quite possible. Or if I wasn't, I had people around him, maybe even stretching their hands forth, praying over him, binding devils. I was looking at him like, are you feeling the love yet? Are you feeling that you are headed straight to hell and we need you to get saved? I was just staring at him. I remember when the pastor was doing the big close on salvation. He said, everybody bow your heads. I bowed my head, but I peeked over at my dad. He did not bow his head. He's like, I'm not bowing my head. He had his chin up. He was looking at the preacher, just like staring him down. And the preacher was like, if you were to die tonight, where would you go? And my dad was just glaring at him like, to hell, and you can go there too. He did not even have a moment of reverence at all. I was horrified. And so the guy kept preaching, and he was like, I just, you know, I sense there's five more people in here that need to get saved. I was like, five, definitely. Come on, dad, come on, dad. So he was like, if you're sitting next to somebody and you think they're hesitant, take their hands and come down with them. I remember I grabbed a hold of my dad's so crying at this point, dad, you want to go down? He jerked his hand away from me. He stood up. He let out a stream of cuss words, went storming out of the back of the church. We found him afterwards smoking a cigarette. I think I cried and he was like, I am so glad to be flying out of town today. I mean, he left us in the wake. He went back to Florida, but you know what? I'm relentless. And so I understood that I wasn't gonna get my dad to visit and go to church with me again, but that didn't mean I couldn't bring the church to my dad. And so I actually contacted some churches in the Orlando area, we were living in Dallas at the time, and I asked these people to contact my dad, to invite him to church, to offer to pray from. So these people were calling my dad. My dad would call me and say, get your beeps off of me. I am not some dog that you say, then people chase it after me. I mean, he, so, so ridiculous. So I'm like, you don't understand. You need to get saved. You need to get saved. I can't be in the ministry until you're saved. You need to be saved, dad. You're holding everything up. So John went away on a men's retreat. And I decided I'm gonna fast the whole weekend. I had heard somebody talk about fasting and praying. So I was like, I'm gonna fast. I'm not gonna eat again until my dad is saved. Okay, thank God he released me of that vow or I would have died. But anyway, I prayed and prayed and prayed. This is before portable phones, stared down the phone, willed it to rig, commanded angels to invade my dad's room, give him bad dreams, give him good dreams, whatever needed to happen. I just believed in any second the phone was going to ring. My dad was going to be miraculously saved, but it didn't happen. And I cried out and I cried out and cried out. And finally, finally, when I was almost like at the edge of just exhaustion, I heard God say something to me that actually shocked me. He said, Lisa, I love your dad more than you love your dad. And I was like, wow, I never even thought about that because I barely like my dad. Okay, you love my dad. And he said, and I want your dad saved more than you want your dad saved. But you can't make this happen, Lisa. Do you believe my word? I thought, of course I believe your word. I'm like going to preach your word. He said, well, Acts 16 says that you and your household mm -hmm. shall be saved. Mm -hmm. Now stop being weird and just love and respect your father. 
give him to me. And I remember that day I wrote in the margin of my Bible that me and my house will be saved. And I wrote my dad's name right there by that promise. And then from that point on, I began to just love my dad, respect him. I actually talked to him as though he was a Christian, which was kind of an interesting conversation with somebody that's completely reprobate. But anyway, I would just tell him what was going on. But I also still really had a longing for my dad to be part of my life and my children's life. But whenever I would bring my children to visit my dad, my dad would always, always be drunk. And he would say horrible things in front of my children, horrible things to my children. And then one time we drove all the way down there, it was three hours away, with our kids, loaded up with Christmas gifts. And my dad, he didn't even bother to be there. He put a little note on the door and he said, sorry, I have other plans. I remember I cried the whole way back. I loaded the four boys back in the van. John was driving. I just started crying. I said, I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. John was leaving for Sweden the next day. We had just done the six hour round trip. My kids were saying, where's grandfather? Why are we seeing grandfather? I thought we were going to go swimming. And then I'm just, <gasps> and you know, that's really awkward for little boys. And so they just began to pat me. They'd be like, okay, okay, okay. What they were really saying was, dad, make her stop. Make her stop. We just were really not enjoying this. But I wasn't okay. And the next day I drove down to the Orlando airport, put John on the on a plane, came back home to my house, put my boys in the backyard, fell on the carpet, I began to play some of the Hillsong songs, and one of those songs was, You're a Father to the Fatherless. And I remember in that moment, it was the first time I actually felt fatherless. And I let the revelation of it just wash over me. I began to cry. I was like, I am fatherless. Not because I'm an orphan, but because I rejected. And I remember crying and giving myself completely over to it. When I, I sensed, I heard God laugh. I was like, what just happened? I'm having this painful moment. Did you just laugh about this? Because this is really horrible. And I, I sat up and I, I heard God say, you're, you're looking at this all wrong. When you are completely and utterly abandoned and rejected by your father, then you are completely and utterly adopted by me. What you see as rejection I see as adoption. I remember I got up off the carpet. I was like, so sad for John. I am the new favorite. I mean, I am like God's direct daughter. John's got a dad here on earth. He's got like a, a funnel, but me, direct contact. Years went past and my dad's condition and the alcohol got worse. Time unfolded and he ended up being in an alcohol related dementia center. And, um, for some reason, I just started to feel like I needed to come and see him. And we were in the Christmas of, of, of 2010. And um, Juliana and Addison and I, uh, we, oh, no, it was 2009. What year was it? 2009. 2009. Uh, Juliana, Addison, and I brought Asher to go see my dad. And when my dad came out, he wasn't the big, scary Italian man I remembered. He was frail and he was um, barely there and we sat down with him he, he he really he couldn't really talk and we answered him asked him questions and he would nod and he wasn't fully putting together the picture of who Addison was and who Julie was and who I was and who Asher was but I had brought some photos and I showed him a photo of him with Addison and and I kept talking and all of a sudden he like he picked up the photo of him and Addison and he pointed at Addison. Addison was probably two years old in that photo. And then he realized that that was Addison's baby and that was him with Addison. And all of a sudden, all the lights went on. And I knew, he knew that I was his daughter, that this was my son, that this was my son's wife, and that this was his grandson, great grandson, actually sitting in this place with him. And I looked at him because I could just see in his eyes that he actually realized what was going on. And I thought in my mind, Heavenly Father, what do I say to this complete stranger 
who is headed straight to hell. What do I say? And I heard, tell him he was a good dad. I thought, that's a lie. I am not saying he was a good dad. He was a horrible dad. I heard the Holy Spirit say back to me, he was as good as he knew how to be. Tell him he was a good dad, but I'm stubborn. I said he could have read books. He could have talked to the good dads. He could have figured out a way to do it better. He didn't care enough to be a good dad. And you know what? I didn't hear anything. Because you know what God does? He puts something down on the table. You either do it or you don't. He never changes his mind. He doesn't argue with you. And so I took my dad's hands and I raised them up in front of me and I looked him in the eyes and I said, Dad, you were a good dad. And it was like an electric current went through his body. I watched him, his eyes like fill up with tears and he looked at me and he, he took my hands and, and he kissed the back of my hands. And then he said the only two words he said the entire time that we were there. He said, thank you. And when he said thank you, I watched Addison get up. I heard Julie begin to cry. And we began to pray over that broken, wounded man who had lived under such a weight for so long. And we said, Father, forgive him. He owes us nothing. We thank you that he is translated from a kingdom of darkness into a kingdom of light. We remit his sins. We cancel his debts. And the whole time we're talking, he was just nodding and crying. He couldn't, he couldn't say the sinner's prayer. He couldn't. But he knew what was happening. Put him to bed. We, I went and met with one of the nurses and I said, I just want to make sure you have all my contact information correct. He walked out. He walked right past us. He didn't know who we were. He sat down and watched Lawrence Welk with a bunch of other people. We had that one moment in time. About a year later, I began to sense something wasn't right. I started to think maybe my mom was, you know, I just asked my mom, she was saying that my dad was fine, but I said, I, I feel like something's not fine. I feel like, I feel like dad's gonna die, I've had some dreams. And she's like, oh no, it's ridiculous. He'll outlive all of us just out of spite. Are you kidding? He's fine. But I just didn't feel that. On New Year's Eve, I was cutting vegetables and watching the news and this newscaster was on and she was sharing about her father and she was showing pictures of her fishing with him on a boat and all this stuff and, you know, obviously had a beautiful relationship with her father and then she said, goodbye, dad, I'll miss you. And I, I realized I was crying. I'm like, oh my gosh, this is perimenopause. Am I going to be crying with people that I don't know about their fathers? I don't know. Wow, this is going to be a really long season of my life. I am going to be crying with random strangers for quite a while. But I heard, no, you're crying because this is the year you're going to say goodbye to your father. Five days later, I'm in Canada. I wake up really early and I just feel like something isn't right. Something isn't right. I can't sleep. Something isn't right. I go do a bunch of shows at Huntley Street. Still, that feeling of something not being right is just overwhelming me. I, as soon as I'm done with all the tapings, I turn on my cell phone. I see this list of phone calls, and I see it's from my youngest son. So that would be the first call I make from Canada. I'm like, Arden, are you okay? He's like, I can't find my retainer. And dad does not know the number for the orthodontist. I'm like, wow, okay, this is not the emergency I'm getting in my spirit. The next number is, Lisa, this is Sherry at Messenger International. John does not have the office for the orthodontist number. I was like, oh my gosh. I mean, there was like eight numbers about Arden's retainer. Miss Bevere, we need a visa for your son's retainer because we're not replacing this one. You have to buy this one. I'm like, oh, wow. There was one number that I didn't recognize. And I thought, you know what? I'm gonna go through immigration and customs and call that number when I get on the other side. I get on the other side, I dial that number, and I hear the beginning of the recording. And actually all I remember of it was, as you know, your father is dying. We started a morphine drip on him 
this morning. I remember I felt like I was going to faint. I was like, I just hit the redial back number. I didn't even listen to the message. I, I didn't get her name. I just hit redial back and I was like, no, I don't know my father's dying. How would I know my father's? He's like, I'm on my way. He's been in hospice care. I'm on my way right now to go see him. If I can get, you know, get to him, I'll put my cell phone up to his ear and you can talk to him. I'm like, I'm boarding a plane. And then I try to get off and I, there was no flights to Orlando. So I thought, well, I'll go to Denver and navigate it from there tomorrow morning. I was just panicked. So she gets there. She calls me. People are putting their bags in the overhead up and down the aisle. Flight attendants giving me dirty looks. And I'm saying goodbye to my dad. I'm saying, Dad, this is Lisa. I just want you to know I'm coming tomorrow. But if you can't, wait, you can go. I love you. I remember you taught me how to dive. I remember you used to take me fishing. All right, bye. I drove home, called my brother, gathered my children. I was home for 15 minutes. And I got the phone call that he was gone. And I remember thinking, oh my gosh, I'll never say goodbye to him. It was arranged that he would have no funeral, no memorial service, and they were just gonna cremate him. I remember crying, my boys made the ultimate sacrifice. They watched Anne of Green Gables and Anne of Avonlea all in one night with me, just wrapped in a blanket. But I remember just feeling like, I don't know. January, February, March, April, I continued to travel in the year 2011, and I preached the faithfulness of God. Then in May of 2011, I met the faithfulness of God. I was doing a conference in Jacksonville, Florida, and I looked out in the crowd, and I saw this girl with cute, spiky, kind of like Shelly's hair when she spikes it up, but it was red, hair, and I noticed her in my first session. Then I did a breakout session on parenting. I noticed her again. Then I went into my hotel room. I came down the lobby. There she is. Okay, seriously, I'm going to have to like meet this person. So I walk over to her and I said, hi, I'm Lisa. And she said, Lisa, I'm April. We spoke on the phone. I'm like, I don't know any spiky red haired Aprils in Jacksonville, Florida. And she said, no, no, no. I, I drove six hours to come and tell you about your father. She said, I am the person that held the phone up to your dad when he was dying so you could talk to him. She explained to me, she said there was an order in the files that you were not to be, uh, that nobody was supposed to tell you or your brother that your dad was dying. And she said, but I did not know Toscano was Bevere. And she said, when you left to Sticky on that night when Addison, Julie, and Ash and I visited, I made the correlation between Bevere and Toscano. And she said, I've read every single one of your books. And I said, there is no way Lisa is not saying goodbye to your father. So I called you from my cell phone. And then she said, I need to tell you about your dad. She said, he was an awful patient. She said, I've been his social worker for the last five years. He stole a car. He got beat up by the police. He beat up another patient. He ran away from his last facility. And you know, he's just been known for violence. She said, but for the last year, he was an angel. And I looked at her, I said, the, the last year? And she said, yeah, the last year, he was an angel. That was when I realized that when I forgave my father, he allowed God to forgive him. When I canceled his debts, he received what Jesus had done for him. Who is waiting for you to cancel their debts? Who is it in your life that you are afraid to love? Who is it that you are afraid to forgive? You do not understand how powerful a sword yielded is. I'm going to ask that you would pray. And whoever the Holy Spirit brings to remembrance, you go to that person. Maybe it's not your dad. Maybe it's your mother. Maybe it's a friend. But the Holy Spirit will give you the right words to open up their heart so that they can be restored to heaven in Jesus' name.